Anastasia, I guess, like the most people when they are left alone, such people, too, feel the burden of matter and everyday problems from time to time. They obviously understand that everything they have achieved on the walk of life is not genuine, it is not the result which their soul desired, and that all this is mundane and superficial. Does it happen that the animal nature completely seizes power over such gifted people? Written, it does. But in such cases, these people turn into really selfish aggressive mutants, there is no other name for such creatures. But this only goes to prove that subpersonalities have practically no influence over which vector of his or her own development the new personality chooses during life. Let us put it this way, even if the subpersonality had achieved significant spiritual heights back in its day and all it lacked was only one step to nirvana, the final escape from the circle of rebirths, this does not mean that the subsequent personality will make this step. As a rule, the opposite usually happens since such personalities, with a spiritually evolved subpersonality, are exposed to more attention from the animal mind already in early childhood. As a result, instead of continuing their development in the spiritual direction and achieving the final fusion with the soul, that is, spiritual liberation, escape to nirvana, these people waste their gift, their valuable power, inherited from the previous personality, on an illusion imposed by the animal nature. In the end, instead of the intended leap forward in the spiritual sense, the person falls back, thus burdening his personality and the soul. Naturally, he ends up in the reincarnation circle again, only in much worse conditions this time. And, as a fact, this personality will have to experience death, become a subpersonality, and then suffer in new bodies for a very long time because of his fatal mistake. Anastasia, so they spend this power not on a leap into eternity, but on ruling over their own kind in this mortal moment which passes very quickly. Rigdon, yes. It is foolish to give preference to mortal matter when just a footstep away from spiritual eternity. The body will die anyway, but what will you be left with? Intelligent material structure's fear of inevitable destruction is exactly the main reason due to which inner opposition to God and his world, coming from the animal nature, appears in a person. Such an opposition appears where the spiritual and the material worlds collide or intersect. This phenomenon is described in some religions as a battle between archangels and fallen angels. But in reality, these are mere associations. This does not mean that someone somewhere is waging a heavenly war for the human soul. All this is taking place here and now inside every person, and the battlefield is his consciousness, thoughts, emotions, and desires. Their preponderance in favor of either the spiritual or the material means victory or defeat of the personality in the momentary battle for the soul, and eventually, for the right to merge with it and transition to eternity. It is scary to lose a battle but fatal to lose the war. Why does man fear God, by turn loving him and then hating him? Because everyone, due to repeated reincarnations of their soul, knows subconsciously that there is a spiritual world, there is God, and spiritual beings serving him. The latter are called angels in legends among people. But they do not look the way people imagine them in the associative categories of religion. These are beings of another dimension which is different from the three-dimensional world. After all, that reality cannot be described in words. Any attempt of such an interpretation of that world will be associatively linked to this world by human thinking and so, will distort reality. And if the subsequent transfer of this information is then carried out under the dominance of the animal nature, well, you yourself, having encountered it repeatedly, have seen what form these legends eventually take and how they are fleshed out with extra details. Let's take, for instance, the tales of God's judgment. In fact, everything is simple, each time after death of the material body, a person, or rather the personality and the soul with subpersonalities, has a meeting with representatives of the spiritual world and gives, so to speak, an answer for the life lived, after which man's further destiny is decided. Hence, various legends among the peoples of the world about God's judgment, the afterlife fate of man, and so on. Yet, 
how everything is twisted and dished up in those same religions and various beliefs. All this misunderstanding takes place also due to the fact that during its life the personality has no access to the memory and experience of subpersonalities and the person does not know the whole truth about himself. If the life of a human, personality, didn't start from scratch every time with memory of past lives blocked, there would be no conditions for making a choice. If people consciously remembered all the reincarnations of their soul and the unbearable suffering which their subpersonalities are still experiencing, I assure you that all people would have long ago become angels. But, unfortunately, the memory of past lives is blocked. Each time a person has to plunge into this world again for the sake of independent conscious spiritual maturation of his personality. Still, what is good about such a clean slate of the new personality's consciousness? First of all, by the fact that priorities are inscribed on it anew which determine the dominant choice during the life of the new personality, regardless of previous merits of subpersonalities. That is, if the person drastically changes his life vector in favor of the spiritual nature, directs his dominant thoughts to the spiritual channel and disciplines his consciousness, then he, the personality, will get a real chance to save himself and his soul in his life. After all, in such a case, he will start to qualitatively transform himself for the better and to live in the spiritual world. However, if human, the personality, again wishes to get caught in the fetters of material thinking with thoughts of the animal nature invariably dominating in him, then such a personality will have only one route, to become a subpersonality. For the person will be spending the power intended for liberating the soul on the never-ending desires of the material world. Do you understand the fundamental difference between the life of a person in whom the material dominates versus the one who is dominated by the spiritual? When the material dominates in consciousness, a person lives by the material world, only occasionally thinking about the soul. Sometimes, he may even try doing spiritual practices. He usually regards the latter as one of his hobbies or as a means of helping to develop superpowers in order to strengthen his influence on people and so on. At that, such a person naturally does not bother much to work on himself and tame his animal nature. But when the spiritual dominates, the personality in its new quality lives by the spiritual world, by its love for God, abiding in it constantly. In this state, the person looks at all the tricks of the animal nature with humor, knowing their nature and foreseeing its further attacks and subsequent actions. And they no longer burden the personality, for a person does not fall for them because in his thoughts and feelings he lives already by the spiritual world. As for the material world, he only comes in contact with it since he continues his existence in the physical body, doing good deeds. Anastasia, yes, indeed, one who is in love is in God and God is in him, for God is love. Written, a truly holy human lives by this. Anastasia, the knowledge about subpersonalities is valuable but in a person, it may give rise to fear that he won't have enough time within this life to develop to a state of complete spiritual liberation of himself and his soul and will, therefore, become a mortal subpersonality. Written, well, first of all, such fear can be caused only by egoism, that is, the animal nature. Secondly, you yourself have witnessed a person receive the knowledge, so to speak, from scratch, just like everyone else in the group. But he became so inspired by those seeds of truth and desired to unite with the spiritual world so strongly that it took him only two years of conscientious work on himself for the spiritual world to accept him. And this despite all the unfavorable living conditions he was in, compared to the rest of the group. So, where there's a will, there's a way. And thirdly, when love for God prevails in a person's life, any fear vanishes on the way to achieving the desired goal. I will give you a figurative example for understanding the essence of spiritual deeds. Imagine a person at war, defending his motherland. He loves it so ardently and deeply that he is ready to fight for it with all his strength, stop at nothing for victory, and do everything possible and impossible for the sake of one goal, to liberate his motherland. For the love to motherland, he is ready to die for it. He 
doesn't care what will happen to his body. The main thing for him is the feeling that he is experiencing which leads him into battle and makes him fight triumphantly. And this feeling of love does not leave him even when he is taken prisoner by the enemy and knows that he is destined to die in agony. Because he is filled with the feeling of true love, for which he has lived and for which he will die. So everything depends on the person. If he is filled with true love for God by which he lives every day, then there is no room for any doubt in him. He has only one goal, victory for the sake of liberating his soul. Anastasia, yes, victory at any cost. Written, so, saving his soul is the main deed in the life of a human, his main goal, the meaning of his existence. The salvation of the soul is the real service to the spiritual world and not to the material one. Save yourself and thousands around you will be saved. And there is nothing difficult here as long as there's a wish. One should simply start with the basic, work on oneself. The human brain is like a computer, the output depends on what you put in, it will work in the direction of the goals you set and the programs you install in it. During life, its memory accumulates the experience of various associative sensations, perceptions, thoughts, feelings, and so on. These associations are mostly linked to impressions received from the surrounding world. Why is it very important for the modern person walking on the spiritual path to constantly broaden his horizons, read more, get acquainted with various information, and enrich his background knowledge in various fields? Because then, a person will have more associations, an improved memory, and a comprehensive perception of the world. After all, the subconscious, out of which associations are drawn, is similar to a cupboard, what you once put in there is what you will later find. The material structure of the brain holds images, holograms, which it received during the lived life. For example, when a person receives new information through eyesight or hearing, an excitation of neurons takes place in a certain area of the brain. The brain processes the information and, if we use the categories already known to you, an excitation of certain information building blocks occurs. The brain detects what it is based on the previous knowledge and experience. This encompasses everything, sound, sensations, knowledge, and so on. Figuratively speaking, the brain operates as a search engine in the computer, for instance, if you type in the word kindness, it will return all the files with information containing this word. In general, the brain searches for what is similar to the associations that are in the contents of the cupboard of our subconscious. At the same time, it also stores new information with its characteristics, replenishing its cupboard with it. If a person is too lazy to improve his knowledge and develop analytical skills, limiting himself only to what mass media presents to him ready-made, he becomes an ideal object to be controlled by priests and politicians through his own consciousness. Because of his own laziness, the person consciously narrows his horizon of knowledge. And when one's brain is barren of associations, the majority of which are often looped on material priorities, such a person becomes spiritually weak, it is easier to control and deceive him and instill certain guidelines in him. Actually, that is why priests and politicians seek to bring a person to the state of narrowed consciousness. In such a state, he is convenient for their control. Furthermore, it is enough to put certain associations and role models into his consciousness, and the person becomes an obedient puppet in their hands. Anastasia, that's right. If you demonstrate to a person how bad everything is, he will replay bad things in his thoughts, inadvertently focusing his attention on them, he will revive and actualize negative situations, recalling the relevant associations. After all, like attracts like. At the same time, if good things are demonstrated to a person, if his attention is drawn to the spiritual aspects of life, if examples of kindness, morality, culture, good manners, and a spiritual way of thinking are shown to him more often, then he will be forming his worldview already in this direction. Written, people, by their nature, are suggestible and initially inclined to imitate. At that, they always strive for something new often without knowing what in particular. By the way, 
why is a person always lacking something and is searching for and learning new things? Because the soul pushes him to search for its native, spiritual world. But different light filters in the form of sub-personalities and the animal nature, which dominate in human consciousness, distort the vector of the search. A number of problems in man's spiritual quest are created also by the associative perception of the material brain. After all, the spiritual world is different from the material one. And everything that a person perceives here, as they say, with his five senses, is the perception of only a small part of the three-dimensional world of the material environment which is furthermore viewed through the prism of associative material thinking. In other words, by thinking in categories and associations. Of the three-dimensional world, man tries to understand what the spiritual world is. Anastasia, through the prism of material thinking? Well said, and the essence is expressed so accurately. Rigdon, yes. As you know, the human brain is tuned to the frequency of the animal nature from birth. Although it does not mean that one cannot change these settings later. One can. The brain is programmed to several states of consciousness. But change is possible only through personal desire and aspiration of man himself. For the most part, people do not even know about all this, that is why during their lives they behave just like any other intelligent matter. When a person encounters knowledge which broadens his perception of the world, the first thing that triggers in him is the animal nature. Roughly speaking, the animal nature rears up, revealing the first human vice, pride, so as not to lose its power over man. The person thinks that he already knows everything and can do it all. But when he plunges into the knowledge, he understands that this is far from the truth and that such initial judgment was wrong. Anastasia, yes, pride is a bane of many people, and everyone is prone to it in varying degrees. I believe it is important for each person to know the secret enemy in the face at least in order to understand oneself and one's nature better. You once mentioned in a conversation that pride is a manifestation of governance of the animal mind in a person. Written, that is true. It is very difficult for a person to realize that what he considers to be his own thoughts, which form his self, are a mere result of his choice between the will of the spiritual nature and the will of the animal nature. This is particularly difficult to understand for people who, since their childhood, have lived in a society with the corresponding consumer priorities, such as, for instance, priorities of materialistic psychology and related values. It is just as difficult for those whose consciousness is limited by a single religious, philosophical, or some other concept built on the principles of dominance of the values of the material world which have been covered up by spiritual postulates. It is pride that motivates many thoughts of a human. Pride is a feeling. A feeling as such is a force, energy, this is the basis on which the dominant thought arises. It is very important what a thought is colored with, desires of the animal nature or desires of the spiritual nature. After all, this determines whether the feeling of, for example, dignity will turn into pride and, hence, a sense of self-love exaltation of self above others or into the feeling of noble, internal honor for your own deeds on the spiritual path in aspiration for God. Here, perhaps, we should delve into the human nature, into the origin of his deepest aspirations and their projections in the world of matter. In the life of a human, it is very important what kind of feelings a person begets with his choice and accumulates throughout his life. Why? Because with this baggage, with this information or, figuratively speaking, with this self, the personality, he is to leave for beyond after death of the body and answer for this choice of his. Now let us look at the mechanism of origination of a feeling. The initial impetus of any feeling comes from the deepest inner force which comes from the soul. Since the soul is a very powerful particle from the non-material world, it always has one vector of movement, one wish to escape from this world into its own world which people call the spiritual world, the world of God. This initial impetus from the soul is the basic principle of generation of the powerful deepest feelings. If one uses this power purposefully on the spiritual course, 
then it will be sufficient for the person, regardless of the past, to leave the cycle of rebirths during his or her life. When such a deep feeling arises, our material brain begins to react to that power and, consequently, to interpret these feelings through our consciousness in its own way. That is, the person, guided by his associations, begins to interpret the arising feeling according to the thinking pattern that he is accustomed to. At this stage, it is the person's worldview that plays a very important role. This includes everything that has been put into his consciousness since childhood, the entire accumulated life experience, the formed behavior and thinking patterns, including those shaped by mass media, which became rooted in his subconscious as well as his personal scope of knowledge, the ability to control thoughts and focus his attention. The person's dominant worldview determines how and where the power emanating from the soul is spent. After all, consciousness often simply splits and distorts this inner single power, the deepest feeling, through the prism of dominant thoughts. Anastasia, can this process be compared, for example, to how a sunbeam is refracted in a triangular glass prism? i.e. to the decomposition of the beam into a multicolored rainbow spectrum? Rigdon, absolutely. This process can be figuratively compared to light dispersion when a single wave is divided into several waves of different lengths. Consciousness with the accumulated experience of its associations is like a prism which divides the single force and directs it to numerous small constituents, thoughts, adding hues to this force. Whatever is dominant in the person's consciousness, such is the shade of thoughts, such are the desires. Thanks to this force, thoughts from the animal nature make desires themselves hyper-colorful and attractive in an illusory way, that is, in essence, they do not correspond to reality once realized, because they are hollow. Simply put, the dominant thoughts, on which attention is focused, direct the power of that single deepest feeling towards implementing a person's desires. Anastasia, as they say, force will always be force. It is the person's choice and where he directs this force that matter. Rickman, absolutely right. Take, for instance, the feeling of pride or of hatred. There is a contemporary proverb, love and hate are just one step apart. As of today, Neuroscientists have already confirmed that when the feelings of hatred or romantic love arise in a person, for some reason one and the same areas of the brain become active even though these feelings are fundamentally different. When scientists reach scientific understanding of the force that lies at the basis of the dominant thought, they will understand why this happens. In fact, everything is simple. After all, it is not a matter of external circumstances or the fact that someone has affected the person's megalomania, offended, said, or did something wrong. The matter is solely about the inner feelings of the offended person himself. It is simply that the animal nature, which is dominant in the consciousness of this person, simply uses the same power of the deepest feelings, only colors it into other thoughts with help of the imagination, presenting everything as a negative situation. Furthermore, this invented sketched story is then filled in with different associations which the person has gathered from the behavior pattern imposed onto him in similar situations. And there you have the subject of a conflict. There are times when the animal nature simply distorts or substitutes notions. For example, a person starts complaining, I do everything for others but nobody does anything for me. This is precisely a substitution. The animal nature is a consumer. The spiritual nature is the benefactor. If you trace the root of the offense, you will find it inside yourself. External resentment towards someone is a result of you losing to your animal nature. Resentment indicates that you were wrong towards, first of all, yourself. Distrust in yourself and doubts arise from not knowing the truth. Ignorance of the truth, from reluctance to look inside yourself, for the truth is there. The truth is life or death. Fear of the truth, which comes from the animal nature, distorts it, trying to postpone it. But the truth is inevitable, no matter what choice the person makes. Not even a dungeon will deprive a luminous soul of freedom and no earthly power will set free an animal doomed to death. Anastasia, so, 
In essence, it means that in conflict situations, people waste their power intended for spiritual growth, written, and they waste it foolishly, choosing the animal nature, for which they will subsequently have to answer. The ancients, while explaining the spiritual journey of human, figuratively compared the body to a boat in which person sails the ocean of illusions, heading for the lighthouse of the soul. The animal nature and the animal mind, on the other hand, were compared to an all-pervasive enemy who seeks to occupy man's mind with temporary unimportant things and distract from the eternal, from the light of the soul's lighthouse. After all, a predilection for the illusion of matter narrows the outlook and limits the mind to the problems of the boat, not extending further than one meter from its edge. This is how man's enemy tries to lead a person astray from the right direction. However, one shouldn't be deluded by the ocean of illusions and the short stay in the boat. When a person finishes his voyage, he will abandon the boat on the shore as something temporary which is no longer needed for his journey and is subject to decay and destruction. Everything visible will disappear and turn into nothing, the way a burning candle disappears. Only the one who is not attached to visible things takes care of the soul. As wise people said, save your soul for its catcher is not sleeping. Keep guard over every hour and each minute and use your life for the benefit of saving your soul. Anastasia, only the one who is not attached to visible things takes care of the soul. That is really so. It is precisely the visible which, to a large extent, tempts people in their thoughts. The discovery of invisible facets, which are present in them and which are perceived through the deepest feelings, helps them not only to feel the world of the soul but also to desire it more than anything in the material world. I've met many people who are walking the spiritual path without surrendering to their animal nature. Yes, sometimes they do lose to it at certain moments but then they realize this and gain valuable experience of avoiding such traps of it. Such people often ask how to protect themselves against attacks of the animal nature and how to prevent their manifestations, how to recognize them and avoid development of a negative situation in themselves. Written, one simply needs to know the mechanism of attacks of the animal nature, their nature, and learn how to control oneself. Note that when a person stays on the spiritual wave, develops himself, and does spiritual practices, he has an expanded state of consciousness. In meditations, for example, he feels that his consciousness kind of goes beyond the usual facets of perceiving the world. And most importantly, the person experiences feeling of joy, happiness, emanating outwards from the soul, that is, as though from within him, from the depth of his feelings to the outside surrounding world. It is this feeling that the brain identifies as feelings of heavenly happiness, joy, and freedom. Consciousness becomes clear, sharp. All the earthly problems seem trifles compared to this feeling of native home, of immense peace, and eternity. Accordingly, the mood also becomes cheerful, elevated, and actions become filled with power. Now, let us examine what happens to a person when the animal nature attacks him. Attacks of the animal nature can be different. You must know your enemy by sight, as they say. To begin with, Let's examine the violent attack of the animal nature which is based on resentment, a sense of dissatisfaction with oneself, or excessive self-criticism, under the common slogan of life didn't work out, the victim position. First of all, such a violent attack of the animal nature can be described as an external pressure. If you look carefully from the perspective of the observer from the spiritual nature from where this pressure stems, which can be sensed even at the physical level, you will feel it coming exactly from the outside, from top to bottom, as if pressure from the side of the head or from the back to the chest. As a result of such a violent attack of the animal nature, within a short period of time, one turns from an active individual into a passive person, becomes disoriented. He seems to lose some kind of a foundation, a base under himself. Negative images, thoughts, and far-fetched problems suddenly surface and start playing in his consciousness, drawing and focusing his attention on them. When this happens, a person experiences a state of dissatisfaction and emotional stress which manifests itself mainly in standard patterns. 
It gets unpleasant and uncomfortable inside as if something is getting compressed inside the chest. It is difficult to focus on any work because extraneous thoughts are constantly distracting him to muse on one and the same sore subject. Resentment or, as they say, an emotional pain arises, bad thoughts weigh one down, self-blame and self-torment for something begin. A tangle of negative thoughts, associations, and emotions appears. In general, attention becomes focused on the problem which is being intensified by the animal nature. Person's consciousness narrows down to the point of this problem. He starts seeing only this problem and nothing else. For example, a person turns on the TV set, trying to distract himself from these thoughts. But consciousness, as if on purpose, clings and focuses his attention on those fragments of programs which touch on his sore problem. Here is another example, a person in this state begins a discussion with somebody on unrelated subjects. But eventually, he does not even notice that consciousness still unwittingly takes the conversation into the channel of the same contrived problems. If a person experiences such a state, he must understand that this obsession with negative thoughts and such a depressed state of consciousness is actually the beginning of an attack of the animal nature. Anastasia, in other words, the person sort of reacts to the situation one-sidedly. Rigdon, absolutely. He simply loses a holistic perception of the picture of the world, his consciousness narrows. A person becomes obsessed with a certain problem. Figuratively speaking, before this he would see a wide range of colors, but during an attack of the animal nature he is focused only on the black color while other colors cease to exist for him, he does not seem to notice them. What is the purpose of this violent attack of the animal nature? Its goal is to block the connection of the personality with the soul which is why there is a kind of pressure from the outside to the inside. During such an attack, figuratively speaking, the signal from the soul does not reach the consciousness of the personality in its pure form, as it happens in spiritual practices, and is significantly distorted through the activation of contaminated filters. It is important to know that the animal nature mostly catches the human at his own weaknesses, for it is aware of all of the person's weak spots, of his past and present, of all his secret dreams on which he once focused his attention, wishing for this or that benefaction of this world for his precious self. And what is more, the desires which burden the spiritual way do not appear in a person or rather in his new personality out of nowhere. These are mostly traditional materially inclined attitude patterns, which dominate in the surrounding society. Which is why the majority of people are dominated by such qualities from the animal nature as egocentrism, envy, immense greed, and pity for their precious selves. Anastasia, yes, man gets very quickly infected with motivations from the animal nature. Rigdon, by the way, I would like to mention that, during an attack of the animal nature, a person sees himself only as being a good person. He is supposedly super in all respects and everyone else is nothing less than a creepy scum. When a person is in such a state, you'd better not tell them directly that they themselves are to blame because their negative qualities have manifested, otherwise, such people will immediately direct all this negativity in your direction as well. His animal nature will immediately begin to aggressively defend its positions. The fact is that, while in such a state, a person does not consciously perceive your explanations and observations regarding his personality. Why does this happen? First of all, because the person's consciousness is narrowed at this moment and because he is obsessed with his own egoism. In this state, nothing and nobody exists for a person other than me, myself, and I in various guises. Anastasia, well, the animal nature is a true master of laying the blame on somebody else and inventing external causes, should you just give it a chance. Another favorite technique of the animal nature is to slip a thought to a person that will lead him in a vicious circle, it could have been completely different if only, by the way, readers often ask why this kind of looping of thoughts happens, even if a person only feels worse because of this. Written, for two reasons. First of all, this is the work of the animal nature. It creates internal conditions for the choice of the person. 
and what the personality gives preference to in its short life, the will of the spiritual nature or the animal one, good or bad thoughts, is the right of the personality itself. However, the priorities the person chooses daily for his afterlife destiny. Secondly, the looping of negative thoughts is just one of the techniques of the animal nature with which it draws man's attention to itself, making the personality serve the whims of the animal mind, thus wasting life energy on mortal things. The fact is that during such a looping of thoughts, a person engages in self-blame, becomes angry, and is constantly thinking about the past. Simply put, his consciousness narrows to an emotional, one-sided point of perception of some personal problem, at the same time, he does not even understand who, why, and for what purpose has set this very direction of thinking in him. And it is not even a matter of a specific contrived problem, once this problem is solved, another one will surely appear. The truth of the matter is that it is necessary to learn to control oneself, then there will be fewer inner problems since it is those that external situations grow out of in a person's life. Anastasia, that's true, or else such running round in circles will continue until the end of life. It is just like in the proverb, you pull and he pulls. No matter who wins, both will fall. Rigdon, sometimes for half his lifetime, the person will nag at himself because of some missed opportunities as far as improving his life in the material world goes. He dreams of such unrealist happiness and sees it only in a good light for himself, where his own importance, megalomania, is satisfied and takes the first place in his dreams. A person does not take into account that the animal nature is simply drawing another ideal illusion for him and that his dream, once realized, would look entirely different from what he imagined. In this state, man does not understand that, had everything happened differently, nobody knows what kind of a person he would be today and whether he would have the conditions and opportunities that he now has. Since each step in life implies changes and entails a chain of events which shape the future of a person. Anastasia, well, unless human begins to understand his nature, it will be difficult for him to realize what his true happiness consists of. Rigdon, there is another type of attack of the animal nature, the soft and subtle one, based on false pride. It is exactly the opposite of the violent type. During such an attack of the animal nature, a person thinks that he has everything under control, that he is so cool, that everyone around him is praising him. But if you look at this situation from the perspective of the observer from the spiritual nature and analyze these moments of self-admiration, then it becomes clear that all of them are based on self-obsession and egoism. Man's consciousness narrows in the same way, he is similarly focused on his precious self, only this time in another direction. Metaphorically speaking, like a narcissus, he notices nobody around him other than himself and the pressure is again felt from the outside to the inside, only it is not violent but subtle, endearing, satisfying, with a sense of enjoying the outer. Anastasia, what other traps can be expected from the animal nature? Rigdon, the ways of its influence are diverse. For instance, you are doing an important task that will influence many people and their lives in a good way in the end. Already at the first stages of implementation of this task, the beast, the animal nature, starts planting ideas that require you to spend the same amount of efforts and time on them as on the main task. These ideas, which are really not important at the moment, begin to divert your attention with a multitude of their issues that require an immediate solution. Thus, you will simply get caught up in these problems and, as the saying goes, there will be much ado about nothing. But in the end, if you evaluate the efficiency rate of your actions, it will become clear that the mundane actions have not shown such a significant result as the initial action, which you abandoned, could have done. Yet, the time has been lost and efforts wasted. So this is a subtle substitution. Here is another version of an attack of the animal nature from the substitution of notions repertoire. For example, you have managed to notice an attack and were able to hold your position. But suddenly, some sort of panic starts inside, something like help. I urgently want into eternity. What is to be done? 
how can I be saved immediately? This is another subtle substitution. Unfortunately, there are many such substitutions. It happens that, while under the influence of the animal nature and not bothering much with working on himself, a person only boasts about his spiritual development accomplishments in front of others. He thinks mistakenly, out of arrogance, that he is watching out for his animal fully armed. But in reality, this situation resembles the fable about the wolf and the hunter. Once upon a time, a wolf decided to go on a sortie alone so that he could later boast to his pack that, on his own, he went hunting for the human himself. At the same time, a man decided to go hunting alone so that he could later boast to huntsmen that he went hunting a wolf all by himself. So both of them went, the wolf and the man, and both of them were afraid, shivering from fear in the night. Both of them got settled on the edge of a forest, having leaned against a warm tree. So they sat until dawn, pressed to each other back to back out of fear, soothing themselves only with the thought of how they would boast to their fellows that they went hunting all alone. They were warm and cozy and they both were infinitely glad they had remained safe and sound. The wolf was happy that the hunter did not get him, and the hunter was happy that the wolf did not get him. Anastasia, well said. Many people do not bother about real work on themselves. They only suit themselves with flattering thoughts. Later they are surprised why they haven't got any significant results in their spiritual development though they went hunting their animal many times. It is surprising how many subtle substitutions there are. The impression is that it is not only you who is learning more but the animal doesn't sleep either, that it is constantly improving itself on where else it can catch you.